Welcome to Mayo Medical Laboratory's Hot Topics. These presentations provide short discussion of current topics and may be helpful to you in your practice. Our speaker for this program is Dr. Glenn Roberts, a professor of laboratory medicine and pathology and microbiology at Mayo Clinic, as well as a consultant in the Division of Clinical Microbiology. In this series, focusing on highland fungi, Dr. Roberts discusses perhaps the most common fungi that you will see in the clinical laboratory and a significant cause of disease, and this module examines common zygomycetes. This module examines common zygomycetes. Thank you, Sarah, for that introduction. I have nothing to disclose. First, we're going to discuss how to make mounts for a fungal culture so that we can make an accurate identification. This image you see here actually is representative of what happens in the laboratory many times where a plate is contaminated with many organisms and you need to figure out how to identify those that are present. The next image shows you a schematic of what you might see. This is a drawing with fungi exhibiting all the different kinds of spores that might be produced. Maybe not all, but a lot of them. It gives you an idea of what you might expect to find with certain of the cultures. And it's, I kind of call it the universal fungus because it has everything there. You can notice in this uh, in the center there's a tall stalk with a round sac at the top, and this is a sporangium of a, with the zygomycetes. Then we go from there down to penicillium, which is like about 2 o'clock, which has different type of sporulation. And you can just look around in there and see that many of these fungi sporulate differently. And so we will begin to look at some of these as we go along. The first preparation that can be used in the clinical laboratory, and probably the most widely used, is the Scotch tape preparation. Basically what you do is to take a piece of Scotch tape and tear off a piece and fold it up so that the adhesive side is, is facing downward. And what you do is you touch the colony with that piece of Scotch tape. You stretch it out and place it on a slide that has a drop of lactophenol aniline blue on it. The Scotch tape will then stick to the slide and it will allow the fungus to be stained with the dye that you see in the center there. This is an example of where you might end up taking the Scotch tape prep from the wrong place. Many times if you take it from the very center of the colony, that's the oldest part of the culture, and that's where it sporulates the most heavily. In this case, this is what happened. You see all these spores in here, and it's difficult to see because there are so many of them. The bottom line is what you need to do to make a good mount is to make them out from an area that is in between them, the outside advancing edge of the culture and the center of the culture growing up. So it's kind of in the middle. Now this is an example of what you would like to be able to see. This is an organism that has all the spores attached to the canidae for the way they were grown up. This is what the Scotch tape prep allows you to be able to do. If you get it from the right place in the culture, you will see the spores that are attached just as they were growing in the culture. They're attached to the Scotch tape and then you can see exactly how they're produced and exactly how they look. And in this way, you can be able to get an idea of what it is that you're dealing with. Another kind of time-honored uh, preparation is the wet mount. This is where you take a little bit of the colony, you cut it out of the auger with a wire that's been at a right angle, and you take a little bit of the colony along with some of the supporting auger, and you place that on a slide with some lactophenol and on blue. This is an example here of where you see the piece of auger that has been taken up along with the culture. One of the things you have to remember is that it's easy to get too much of the supporting auger on the slide. If you do that, when you put the cover slip on it, if it's too large, what it will do is it will fly out from underneath the culture slip onto the top of the bench where you're working, and that's not what you want it to do. So you have to take a smaller piece. Here you can see the cover slip is going on there, and it will be flattened out unless it's too large, and you'll be able to see the culture kind of as it's been growing. The problem is, with a mount like this is the spores don't stay connected to where they were attached. The pressure that you put down with a pencil eraser or some other object on there to flatten that out causes them to disassociate from the hyphae or the canidae for that they're produced on. Probably the Scotch tape prep is the most universal one right now and the wet mount may be second and then as a last result we have in the past used what's called a slide culture or a micro slide culture. This is an example of what that is. Basically, when you have a problem with a culture and you, you need to see how it produces the spores in detail, what you do is to take a plate 
of 2% agar, it's just water agar, and you place a glass rod that's sterile in there, or you can just lay a slide on top of the agar like you see here. The slide's sterile, and what you do is you take a little bit of the culture, and you cut out like a circle or like a square with a wire or with a sterile test tube. Place the agar plug on the slide in two places, either end. And then you inoculate the four quadrants of the plug with the culture. Then you put a cover slip on top of it. And as it grows, it produces spores just the way it does in the culture, but they'll be underneath that cover slip. And then what you can do, when you think the culture is mature, is you can remove the cover slip, take it off, put it on a slide with some lactophenol in and blue, and look at it underneath the microscope. And you probably will see the spores just as they have been produced underneath that cover slip. Sometimes you, you happen to look at it too early so that you don't see things you, that you need to see. And that's why we have a second plug on there. You can go back and put a, a cover slip on top of that first plug and let it grow longer if you like to. Here's where you take the cover slip off and put it on a slide with a drop of lactophenol in on blue. And then take a look at it underneath the microscope. This is the cheap way to do it. It works well. You take a piece of filter paper, put it in a sterile petri dish break an applicator stick that's sterile in two, and then put the slide on there with a couple of auger plugs and inoculate it. Put a cover slip on top and let it grow. And you put some water in the bottom so that there's enough humidity in there and that filter paper will absorb the water. This presentation will focus on how to identify the common uh, zygomycetes. And there's a movement on foot that has changed the name of the zygomyces back to what we used to call them and they were called the mucorales. So you will see uh, in the literature and in textbooks, some of the textbooks, the term mucorales and they're really referring to the zygomycetes. We continue to use the term zygomycete because it's been used for so many years and it's going to be difficult for everyone to change that but regardless of that at least you know that it's going to be changed to mucorales. One of the things that is the hallmark of these zygomycetes is the fact that they produce these rather large septate hyphae. And septate means that they have few septations, not very many, but occasional septation. And they're usually described as being non-septate, but they're really septate because we can, with most zygomycetes, find a few of the septations, and so that should not confuse you. This is an example of a wet mount this shows you these rather large hyphae that have no septi anywhere in them. And these, if you just look at that one fill, you would say, well, they're non-septate. If you moved around in there, you probably would find a few septations, and we would describe it as positive septate. But that's the point of looking at this is that you make sure that when you look at examining a slide that you need to look at many fields before you make get a consensus idea of what's there. Don't just look at one. There are some of these fungi that will produce septations regularly, and we will talk about those in subsequent presentations. This is an example of what the hyphae look like. They're smaller than the hyphae of the zygomycetes, and there are sep few septations in there, a little difficult to see. There are, is a line dividing up these hyphal strands into compartments. And you can see them in there at about 6 o'clock toward the middle. There's one that's curved a little bit to the right. And above that in the same hypo strand up at about 3 o'clock, there is another septation. So septations are easy to spot once you start looking for them. This is an example of the small hyphae of the dimorphic fungi that are very difficult to interpret sometimes because they are so small. It's hard to tell if there are septations there, but there they are septations and within those hyphae. So we have hyphae that range anywhere in size from the large ones of the zygomyces down to the small ones with the dimorphic fungi. Let's talk about the mucorales or the zygomycetes. These have been defined in, in past years as the bread moles. Uh, they don't grow on bread as often as they used to because we have too many preservatives in the bread. But they'll grow on just about anything, on, on fruit, on vegetables, lots of things that sit around for a while, even in things that sit in your refrigerator. This is an example here of the fruiting head and the supporting structure of a zygomycete. The big round black balls that you see at the top are called the sporangia. Down below is the stalk that supports those, and it's called a sporangiophore. 
So if you were to look at this underneath the microscope, you'd be able to see this. You might not be able to see where it's attached to the auger. That probably would uh, not be present. This is a culture of the zygomycete, and it's kind of defined as being woolly. It's kind of a coarse looking appearance. And it has those black dots in there, and the black dots that you see are the sporangia of the zygomycetes. And here again, you see the hyphae that are large. This is to remind you that this is what you're going to see. Large septate hyphae. Now, we uh, in the past have called these organisms zygomycetes because they produce these spores that you see here as a result of sexual reproduction. They produce these spores called zygospores. Consequently, people named them the zygomycetes. And I think the term mucorales pre preceded the term zygomycete. And so they've gone back to the older term. And that's kind of the rule of thumb in naming things in mycology. This is a drawing showing you what you might see with any of the zygomyces. It shows all the structures that could be possible. The big sac like structures that you see are the sporangia. Each one is a sporangium. The stalk that supports that is called a sporangia four. And then uh, these organisms are attached to the auger surface or any substrate by some of them by structures that look like roots and they're called rhizoids. You find some that have rhizoids. It's the way they're produced and it's where they're produced that helps you to identify them. And so we will go into some detail about that as we go along. This is a uh, schematic showing you the basic structures of a zygomyces. This is a, a real photomicrograph of an organism that we recovered from the back of some wall covering as some remodeling was being done near a, an oncology ward. This is something that you don't want to see in that kind of a setting. But luckily, we were able to pick up on it early and contain that before it was too much uh, organism had spread around the environment. The, down at the bottom are these rhizoids. Those are the root-like structures that you might see with certain of these. The big black structure is the sporangium, the big sac that produces the spores. And the stalk that supports those is called the sporangial four. The term four means supporting. This is a uh, scanning electron micrograph that uh, Dr. Dennis Kunkel allowed me to use for teaching. And this shows you what the sporangium looks like. It's rough on the outside. The interior of that is filled with spores. And you can see the, the stalk there. That is the sporangia 4. And here is a better photomicrograph, scanning electron micrograph of this. And basically what you're seeing here is the sporangia 4 coming up. And at the top of that sporangia 4 is a structure that we call the columella that's found in certain of the zygomycetes. And it looks like here that the sporangium is ready to pop. And what you're seeing there are all the spores that are inside that sporangium. It's almost as if the wall of that sporangium has been removed. And I don't know quite how you took this photograph, but it's very good because it shows you that what's inside that sporangium are billions of these spores that pop out into the environment. This is a, another photograph that shows you the hypey. And notice you notice that most of them are very large. Every once in a while you see a smaller hypal strand as you see on the left hand side. That does happen. What you're looking at in here, the kind of golden colored thing, is uh, a sporangium that's been popped open. The spores are sitting around on the outside and that thing sticking up inside that big sporangium sac the golden thing is, is to call the columella. And uh, you see those when you make them out sometimes a certain of the organisms. This came from Dr. Kunkel as well. This is another example of um, a culture of a zygomycete. They don't always produce these dark black spores as time goes along. Uh, some of them don't do that. One of the hallmarks of these cultures of these zygomycetes or mucorales is that they grow very quickly. If you inoculate a culture at 4 p.m. in the afternoon, you come in the next morning, you'll notice that the culture dish is probably already filled with the organism. And sometimes it'll actually push the lid up. And so the colloquial term we use for these things is called the lid lifters because they push the lid right up. They grow so quickly. And I think the thing to remember about this is that they grow in this culture dish and also in the patient at the same rate. So it's important to make a diagnosis as quickly as you can and to be accurate about it because they invade host tissue just like they grow in the culture plate as quickly as that. 
This is uh, an example of a rhizoid, just to show you one in great detail. They're like root-like structures to actually adhere the culture to the auger surface. So the first one we're going to talk about is one called rhizopus. Rhizopus has these sporangiophores, the long stalks, produce singly or in groups. And the rhizoids are produced at the base of a sporangiophore. The long stalk, at the bottom of that, you see the sporangium at the top, the big sac-like structure, you follow the stalk down, at the bottom of the stalk will be these rhizoids. And when you see that, you know you're dealing with rhizopus. And the sporangia produce these calumella that are kind of almost like umbrella looking things inside of the big sac that you see at the top, the sporangium. This is an example here of rhizopus. We'll start at the top where you see the big black sac, that's the sporangium. Follow the stalk down, that's the sporangia four to the bottom, and you will see the rhizoids or the root like structures coming off right at the base of where these sporangia fours are. You see that? You know you're dealing with rhizopus. And it's, and, but the problem is there are a lot of species of rhizopus that uh, are out there and to try to put a species name on them is out of the realm of our discussion. This is another zygomycete. This happens to be another rhizopus. And you can see that the rhizoids come off right at the base of where this branch and fork comes, is produced. This is rhizopus. Another one of rhizopus where the sporangium is actually uh, broken open and you don't see the sporangia wall anymore. What you see are all these spores that have popped out of that sack on the, about uh, 10 o'clock. And if you look closely, you'll see a darkened area there. It looks almost like an umbrella shape. That is a calumella. And then going all the way down to the bottom, it's a long stalk. That's a sporangia for, and there are the rhizoids being produced right there at the base. So we know that's rhizopus because of those features. This is the world's largest rhizoid. I'm not quite sure why I decided to put it in here, but it gives you an idea of what a rhizoid looks like. There are times when it's difficult to, to try to determine uh, what the organism is. In these zygomycetes, it's difficult to make a Scottish tape prep to identify them. So what you end up doing is making a wet mount and try to take a small portion out. When you do that, you still end up with a lot of organisms. It's all, they're all intertwined among each other. And so you have to find uh, the sporangium and the sporangia four of one and follow it all the way down and see if the rhizoids are produced at the base. In this case, they were. And this is another example of rhizopus, but it's kind of hard to tell that. This is one where you just see the collapsed sporangium at about uh, 3 o'clock. Follow it down there, the rhizoids. And uh, so the rhizoids are at the bottom of the sporangia 4. And that's an example of rhizopus again. So that's, you see something like this, you know you're dealing with that particular organism. Another example of a culture that is growing uh, rather rapidly and you can see the black spots in there, those are the sporangia, this is the zygomycete and the, you can notice that the culture is getting filled already. This is a fairly young culture. There's another one uh, that doesn't show you those black dots of sporangia. This is a culture we're going to talk about which is called uh, lichthymia and the old name for it is absidia. And so the taxonomy of some of these zygomycetes or mucoreles has changed. This is one of those examples. This organism has branching sporangiophores. In other words, the, the stalks that are produced give rise to the big sporangium are branched. There are many sporangiophores, and these are the, the stalks that produce these that have a funnel-like shaped base at the tip. And I'll show you what that looks like and has a conical columella with many of them, particularly one organism, that this one, this lichthymia, there is a septation that is produced down below the columella on that sporangia form. And more importantly, this organism produces the rhizoids, but it doesn't produce the rhizoids right at the base of the sporangia form. When this organism is attached to the auger surface, it produces a cluster of, of rhizoids, and then there's a big branch that goes over and it forms another cluster of rhizoids. The rhizoids are actually produced in between the two big sporangiophores. And so you will see them not at the base of the sporangiophore, but you'll see them in between two clusters of uh, sporangiophores. 
this is not a very good example uh, but you can see that there are sporangia forests and sporangia sitting on the right side and on the left side and in the center you have this cluster of rhizoids so they're not produced right down below the, the stalk that gives rise to the sporangia but they're produced off to the side and this is lecithymia this one here you have to follow it down a little bit to be able to tell what it is but if you start uh, in the kind of off center where you see the rhizoids you follow that long stalk all the way you can see that there is a sporangium coming off in the middle there it's just a very short one and then there's another one coming out pointing downward about 530 this the rhizoids are produced way away from there they're not produced down below them and that's what you call uh, what's called internodal production of these uh, rhizoids and this is lecithymia or absidia this is another example here a little bit harder to follow but if you see the sporangium in the center and if you follow it down just a little ways you'll see there's a septation across there and then you follow it on further down you'll see the stalk goes into a hypostrand, strand and it goes off down to the right and somehow the curls around and there the, the rhizoids off to uh, about 530 over there and there's still a part of that long structure and so the rhizoids are not produced right at the base they're produced down way off to the side hard to see this organism sometimes and, and know what it is this one shows you another example here there's a two sporangia fours with sporangia at the top and you follow to the left hand side near the rhizoids coming off not at the base of those but off to the side and then we have another one which does not produce any rhizoids at all and this is the one that we see fairly frequently it's called mucor and mucor has sporangia fours that are unbranched to, to branch and when they're branched their branch is produced on one side and then the other side and it's called sympodial arrangement of the branches there are no rhizoids with mucor and so that helps you a little bit to be able to tell what it is the name of the infection now that's caused by these mucorales is called mucormycosis it used to be called zygomycosis and again they've gone back to the old terminology and so it's called mucormycosis and so we'll we'll call it zygomycosis just uh, for tradition's sake but know that it would be called mucormycosis in today's uh, terminology from from some people this is the culture plate of another zygomycete to mucor uh, they don't all look alike some are gray some are brown some are black so on and this is an example of the two sporangia that are there and if you look around that's all you're going to find are sporangia and sporangia fours you're not going to find rhizoids at all and this is one where you see the big sac like structure full of spores that's a sporangium the chiamella is that structure dark structure in the center and then at the base of it is the sporangia four produces it sometimes you see these spores that look almost like chlamydoconidia and they're just part of the, the, the mucorales or zygomyces are not diagnostic for them notice the spores in the background those are the spores that come out of those sporangia there, there are numerous of, the, of those present and one of those sporangia gets popped open millions or sometimes billions of spores are released into the environment and this happens during the fall of the year for example when you're out raking leaves these things are found in the soil and then and, and sort of top of this the, the grass and so on uh, as things begin to dry in the fall of the year and you're out raking leaves and everything these things pop open and these clouds of these spores are just everywhere and a normal patient doesn't make any difference if you inhale those if you're an immunocompromised patient, it makes a huge difference because oh, this is a very important pathogen of immunocompromised hosts. 